Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming here. Shit, I still don't know what am I doing at a PHP conference, but uh, that's all good. So I will introduce myself at the end of the talk. I think there is a lot of uh, uh, stuff to look at. Um, and so I'll just keep the introduction, my introduction um, for last. And I'm going to give you an overview of actually like um, what we're going to see in this talk. Uh, first of all, like we're going to dig a little bit in like how Angular works, why we picked it. I work for Namshi, an e-commerce retailer, uh, the biggest e-commerce retailer, I guess, in the Middle East. Um, we're based in Dubai, and we use Angular in a few different parts of our uh, architecture. Um, so to give you a perspective of where we actually employ Angular, well, in a lot of small internal tools, um, okay, so those are not really mission critical. Um, so it's nice to experiment with them. We also use it and abuse it um, on our mobile um, applications. No, I'm not at mobile apps, but on our mobile website, on our mobile checkout, which is probably the most critical part you know, in, a, in an e-commerce ecosystem. And also on our desktop checkout, which is, of course, ugly as hell, because we're an e-commerce venture, so we're ugly as Amazon, at least. Um, so we, we use Angular also like on the checkout. We have a service-oriented architecture, so you might be wondering, why do you have all these applications? Well, because we use microservices. So you know, there is one application that takes care of you know, like this desktop website, one application that takes care of the mobile website, one that takes care of mobile checkout, one blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, why we picked it? Um, it was very, it was very um, quite of a natural choice when we actually dug into you know, how, how to scale uh, into the client side. We have a background of, you know, like uh, PHP engineering. I've been doing that for the past six years. For six years, and then like since the past year, I moved myself to JavaScript. Um, so one of the killer features is two-way data binding. Who of you know, knows uh, what is two-way data binding? A few. Uh, okay, so I won't like go like too deep into it. I mean, basically the model changes the view Okay, and the view changes the model. What the heck? Like, how is that possible? In the sense that we are used to, you know, like pretty uh, sequential applications in the world of uh, PHP. They're generated server side, and once you do something to the view, it's not that it's going to change. Um, you know, it's going to change the model back. You're going you're to send your response to the client, and that, like, there, the life cycle of the uh, of the request ends with the response sent to the to the browser. So I prepared a, a small fiddle to show you what actually like two-way data binding is. So this is a controller in Angular. You can use like a very simple function. It gets in like the scope injected. Scope is, let's say, what is shared between a controller and the views, okay? So we, have, we attach like a variable on the scope. And then like on our views, we we'll first declare our, our app. We declare that it's gonna use the controller that we've just defined in JavaScript, and then you remember, we have scope.title. Then we'll say there are two input fields, and they're bound. Their model is the title field. Okay? So basically, that scope.title will reference the title in the view. Thing is, the view will reference the, the object in the controller as well. So if you've seen, I have two input boxes, right? Which means that when I run this, uh, this simple uh, script, as soon as I'm typing in one box, the other one will get updated. Okay? Because like the view will update the model, and the model is bound to another view, okay, to another input on the view. It's a very simple. Uh, it's a very simple and uh, a linear approach. You can actually check like the official docs to understand like in depth like how data binding works. Basically, Angular watches for values and so on. There is also a new API that is coming in. Uh, I think it's ECMAScript six, which is called Object Observe. Uh, which will do this natively. For now, like the way Angular does it, it just watches values and then propagates the changes. Uh, dependency injection, like we're all symphonians here, so I mean, most probably dependency injection has been one of the revolutions that we that we got going from Symphony One to Symphony Two. If any one of you was there, like back at the time, um, so we have our own like you know plain old controller. It's basically a function. I get the scope injected somehow. And I also get the location service injected. Okay? So this is the way Angular does dependency injection. Okay? So that you can use okay, your services like freely without the need to actually configure anything. 
at least for the native services. And it's actually a little bit automagical, okay? So if you remember in 2012, when, when Fabian introduced uh, Symfony 2, it was like, let's kill the magic. Well, Angular goes a little bit against this direction, and at least for these things, uh, you know, it makes you like, do like very less configuration and, and rely much more on conver convention. So you declare a service, and then you, just, you can just use it. And it does its own voodoo of dependency injection, like natively, um, like with, within the framework. Um, so this is like a very, it's a very simple, uh, it's again a very simple script that you can just uh, check and run and it will show you like how dependency injection works. Uh, the support, I mean one of the most important things uh, I think like when you, pick a, when you pick a tool like Symfony or like Angular, um, it's you know like the community and who's, who's behind and around that. I think Symfony is, is rocking the PHP ecosystem because it has a huge community a, like a very good foundation, it's nine years old, and you know, like you can rely on like a broader uh, list of you know like people and smart minds uh, that are behind it. Uh, Angular has the same, but at the same time, you know, it does also has that's Google um, supports it. You know, basically support uh, Google adopted it from one of its employees, Mishko Avery, who wrote it for one of his personal projects, and then was like, shit, I think this thing makes sense. So let's, let's present it to my boss. Then, like Google incubated it, and, and now they're actively developing it. So when we look at, you know, like, how the market is doing for, uh, for Angular, we saw a huge spike, and that was almost a year ago. And we're like, okay, so probably it's time, you know, to, to, to dig into it. Uh, but we weren't, like, you know, as, like, very silly, like, as silly to, to you know, like, to say, Okay, let's just pick it because it has a huge, uh, a huge boost in, in, in usage over the past months. We've also compared it to, you know, to other frameworks and we've seen that you know, like, the rise of other tools was pretty insignificant to it. Angular was so, so popular that by the time that I looked at it, it actually matched apple pies. Okay? And I really have no idea why. I think because apple pies like, have a very down period in, uh, in, uh, in summer, I guess. It picks up back in October. Um, and you know, there are a lot of other tools that are built around Angular. Um, for example, Protractor is the testing framework that is used uh, specifically for Angular. You can use a lot of other, you know, testing frameworks and test runners, but Protractor has been built by Google. By, like, it's uh, actually actively developed by one of their uh, uh, top engineers. Her name is Julia something. And you know, it's built specifically to test Angular apps. You know, it can wait until, you know, Angular loads all the dependencies or it automatically detects if the HTTP service, which is a built-in service in Angular, has done with an Ajax request. So it will wait until that request is done to then, like, you know, like, uh, trigger your assertions and so on. So it has a good tooling around it. And then one of the things that I really like about Angular is directives. If you remember in Symfony 1, we had components, which is basically, you know, like, an HMVC representation of, you know, like, um, your, uh, your, your response. So, are you familiar, guys, with HMVC, hierarchical MVC? Yeah, no? So basically, we have one request. It hits, like, our controllers. We render a view. But maybe, like, in that view, we also have to render a sidebar or, you know, like, a widget. And then you use, you know, subcomponents, sub-MVC uh, cycles, you know? So you're saying, hey, that sidebar rendered this component, and it will be uh, the job of another controller to render that thing. So you isolate, you know, like logic between these components so that you can then reuse them. And this is what directives are in Angular. So I have my app, which is the SFCon side, whatever, and it has this menu element that doesn't exist in HTML, okay? It's, uh, it's something that we're introducing into the DOM. That is a directive. So that will render, uh, well, that will be rendered like it's a standalone component in your view. You can declare it as, a, as you know, an element. You can declare it as, a, as an HTML attribute, as a data attribute of HTML5. You have a few different ways to declare directives. So say, like an example, like a very silly example, is I have like a list of links, okay, very simple. They have a title, a label, whatever, and a link. And then I have my view. Okay, I'm going to repeat loop through these items, these links, and then I'm going to output, the, you know, like a link with the href and the title of those, uh, of those links. Okay, let's remember, this is the menu component, so we just get a list of links and we output them. 
So this is like how the like a directive is declared. It's ugly as shit, but they're working on it. Um, so I can I can assure you. Um, so first of all, you declare the directive. Its name is menu. Okay, and that's why we can call it menu in our DOM. We restrict it to attributes and elements. That's why AE. AE. So we can declare it as an attribute, like data menu or menu, and as an element, as an HTML menu element, okay? Then let's say it has an empty scope. We don't need to pass anything like externally. We don't have to initialize the scope with some variable or whatever. We have our template. We just declared the path of the template, the template that we've seen earlier. And the template is using like this variable called, called items, which is injected to it like, through the link function which is basically like the main action of a directive, okay? So in Angular, almost everything is the directive. It's very nice because you can, you can, you know, like reuse uh, these directives like across, you know, like different applications or different parts of your application by just changing variables that you inject. You can render one menu here, like another menu there, like with the same directive. And it's a good way to decouple, you know, like pretty basic and simple structure in your, in your application. Basically, like, as I said, everything is a directive. So if I, would, uh, if I were to write, you know, like a new Angular application tomorrow, I would say, for sure I'll have a header, footer, and whatever directive. And then we would use like a controller. At the very foundation of it, a controller is also a directive. So you can, you can basically write, write applications that are controllerless. Um, I would recommend you to have a look at, uh, at actually these kind of links. Um, controllers, directives, and services, because it makes very clear what is what and, uh, and what you should use, okay, in terms of, uh, of like which responsibility you want to give to a controller. Am I going to use a directive? Am I going to use a controller? What really makes sense? And blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's much more in Angular itself, but I'm not here to give you, you know, like a technical, uh, a very in depth technical. Uh, introduction to Angular, because I think if you just go on the website, it's easy as hell. I think you guys are smart enough to just look at it and, you know, like, write your to-do app or whatever. Try to, to, try to use it for your next project. So I'm not there, like, you know, like, to give you, like, the, the easy stuff. I'm actually, I actually want to talk about, you know, something that, is, that goes, like, beyond that. And for example, like, why did we actually uh, like Angular, uh, and we still like it after a year and a half, or yeah, a year and some months. Uh, it has a very solid and clear foundation. So this is how you do the routing, okay? There is a route provider, you declare the routes, template, and controller. It's as simple as, as, uh, as it can get, you know? Um, if you wanna make an HTTP call, if you're familiar with the promise pattern, um, I mean, it's implemented here. If you're not, just get used to it. Uh, you know, you have the HTTP service, Angular services are declared with, Angular's native services are declared with the dollar. I don't know why. Maybe they really like Rasmus. Um, so basically, you just pass a configuration. That's the meter. That's the URL that you have to fetch. In case of success, I'm going to execute something. In case of a failure, I'm going to execute something else. You know, it's very simple. Nothing. You just chain methods, and that's how it works. It works well with the rest of, uh, of the JavaScript ecosystem. I don't know if you guys use JavaScript a lot. We, we kind of abuse uh, of it. Um, so, you know, if you want to use um, Yeoman to generate, uh, to scaffold your, uh, your uh, Angular app, you can do it. There is a, there is a Yeoman generator for Angular. If you want to use a grunt, grunt to, to run tasks, you can do it. If you want to use Bower, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, like it's integrated natively with these uh, this tools. It works pretty well with them. So, you know, for example, if you want to use Jade, that is how, you know, for example, you declare a binding on the view with Angular. It has this mustache syntax, and, and, and it just works uh, out of the box with it. Or if you want to declare an ng model, whatever, and bind it to a model, this is the same exact thing. It lets you, you know, build um, modern API-oriented architectures. Like, all the frontends that we have, you know, they consume an API, of course. It's not that they live on their own. And, uh, you know, it's one of the, once you use these tools, uh, you know, you have an excuse to start appifying everything. Uh, we use the same APIs for our mobile apps, for our mobile website, for our desktop website. There are a few things that change, but, you know, like, from, from one API, you, you can, you know, you can serve, like, all of your applications, or, you know, from one or more APIs, you can do that. 
the idea is that you start from the API and then you have clients, different clients that consume it. It's very easy to scale. For example, we don't use sessions, okay, like we have a stateless architecture. Um, so we actually use local storage when we want to save cards and this kind of stuff. You know, and that lets you scale pretty well because at that point, you know, like uh, for read-only things, you can put varnish on top of your application. It's very easy. You don't have the session, so you can scale as many servers as you want. You don't have to replicate, uh, you know, sessions in the dbeam file systems. You don't have to, you know, use these hackish things. You just keep everything on the local storage. You will run the client, and it's, you know, as simple and lightweight as, uh, as possible. That's what we do. You can also use cookies and so on and so forth. Um, you know, like by, by being able to, to scale a lot on the clients, we've, we personally, we've, we've been able to, you know, like apply a lot of optimization. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're best in class because I don't think we're best in class. But, you know, from like 200 milliseconds, then you can optimize, you can optimize, you can optimize till you get to a point where, you know, like an API takes 70 milliseconds and it's decent enough, at least for us. Um, there are things that you will hate about Angular, and not just a few, probably. Um, JavaScript. I'm not here to debate that JavaScript is the best programming language ever, because I don't think it is. Um, so I would actually recommend you to go to this talk, to, to visit this link. It's, it's, uh, this talk is, it takes really five minutes of your time, and you'll laugh your ass off about the quirks of JavaScript. It's a really, you know, lightning talk about like what's broken in JavaScript. I really, really recommend you. So JavaScript has its quirks and, and so on, so you have to adapt it for like all kinds of browsers. So you will bump into some issues. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you that everything will be fine. And then watchers. So I told you that, you know, um, Angular binds values on the view with values on the model, right? And the problem is that like, it keeps watching these bindings to see if anything has changed. And they're kind of like heavy uh, operations on the, on the DOM because it checks like if that value is there, if that value is there, it has changed and so on and so forth. So when you have a lot of those bindings and a lot of those watches, you know, you get a lot of computation that happens on the client. And you know, if you're not using the, the latest browser or uh, you're not on a very powerful machine, it will you know, kind of lag. The UI will start to lag. Um, for example, like this is like our example menu, right? So you have to prepare for n bindings here, one and two, okay? For the number of links that you have, you bound two properties of those links, okay, of those items, and for each and every single link, you will have two bindings. Now imagine that you have a menu like the Amazon one that you can, you know, like expand, go on a second and third level categories. You can have like maybe like 100, 200 links just in the menu. Okay, which is like a very small part of the application itself. And yeah, that you know, makes it kind of, kind of, uh, kind of very, um, very sluggish, the, at least the UI. Use one-way data binding if possible. Uh, I say if possible because you have to use an external library to do that because Angular enables two-way data binding by default. Uh, so there is this guy, PassBus, who wrote this bind once. Uh, it's basically like a simple library that you can use. So instead of, uh, instead of like declaring ng model or whatever, ng if, it's uh, bind if or some, or I don't remember like the syntax exactly, but that's what it lets you do. So if you don't have values that change in the view, okay, that you have to look for changes, to, to watch for changes, just use one way data binding because they're not going to change, so you don't need the, the watcher there. And try to stay like below 800 watchers. Uh, even though like the UI really kind of lags and, uh, and starts being sluggish at 2,000. I actually met one guy who once told me that they were like at 4,000 watchers and they kind of saw that, uh, that it was really la lagging and I was like, oh shit, you guys are really hardcore. I, I don't know like if they use like ENIAC or what to, to, to run the application, but uh, yeah. In Angular 2, so there's been a lot of talks about Angular 2 lately in the sense that they publish some, you know, um, design drafts, design documents that are open to discussions. Uh, one of the things that they, they put there and has been, uh, has been uh, uh, talked about at the ng-conf in, uh, in Utah this year um, is the ability to turn off, like, the two-way data binding by default in Angular 2. 
And I think that they're going to go with it because, you know, a lot of people are starting to realize that for applications that don't have too much user interaction, you know, static sites or even an e-commerce site doesn't have, like, a lot of interaction with it between the user and the UI. You basically just click a link, you add to cart, and you're done. So they don't need, you know, like, all this, this logic to, to keep, uh, keep watching for changes in, in variables. I mean... We've all been there, some more, some of us more, some of us less. The problem is not only IE. The problem is the browser itself. It might be wonder why. Um, the thing is, you know, now your application runs on the client. It's not rendered on the server anymore. You, you cannot monitor it as easily as, as you would do with, you know, a PHP application, you can profile it very easily, you know, you can install New Relic and, and understand what, what the heck is going on with like on, on each of, of your request on of your requests and responses, whatever. You know, like JavaScript is different because it just runs on the client. It means that if that guy has set his date to 20 years in the future and you haven't thought of it in your application, you're screwed. Because when you're you're gonna do like date get time in JavaScript, it will give you like a date in 20 years in the future. So, and we don't think about this thing because we're used to, you know, like, have everything under the control because we're on the server. But now, like, things are drastically changing. And the worst part is that, like, the browser doesn't just render anymore, you know? The browser is your entire platform. And the VM, on, on, like, on which your application is running, it actually varies. It varies depending, on, you know, on the browser vendor and so on which is not probably the, the best thing to face, you know? So imagine that like some code, some API that you're using in JavaScript will work on, you know, one engine, but not on the other one. And that's why, be, that's why you have all those shims and, you know, like patches and, you know, like stuff to add support for this method and that method in IE or in Safari and so on and so forth. What are the things that I think you will actually need to know about Angular. So we've been there. Um, we've had a lot of struggles, at least initially, um, to understand like how, how, which were the best practices to, to, to build an Angular application. Um, so the first thing that you know, a lot of people ask me is, what is the best way to serve uh, like an Angular app uh, from Symfony 2? And the, like, the answer that I always give is, kill yourself. In a sense that you don't serve Angular from a Symfony app. They're just different. They're meant to do two different ways, do different things, sorry. Okay? Symfony will serve, you know, your APIs, your content, whatever. Angular will consume it. You know, there is no such thing as, you know, like sharing routes between the two and then you first render with Symfony and then Angular kicks in. No, they need to be separate. It cannot, it's not like the best idea to have them working all together. Sure, you can do it, but you'll incur in, you know, like some weird problems. For example, if you use the history location API in Angular, outside of Angular, it will give you like a random error, like that just uh, too many iterations reached. You could Google it on Stack Overflow. Um, so Angular is kind of full stack from that point of view, and it's probably not the best idea to have it running like uh, like in pair uh, with, uh, with, uh, with another framework. So one should serve the content, okay, should do things like authentication, authorization, and so on. Or Angular, whereas Angular consumes those APIs, consumes that content. Uh, if you use the latest major version of Angular 1.3, you're gonna not get support for IE8. And you would say, yeah, whatever, I like it. Um, so what they did is they removed support for IE8 completely. So it really depends on your clients and on your, on your needs, whether you can use it or not. I'll stick with Angular 1.2. They did that, of course, you know, to improve like, performances at various uh, points of the, of the framework like in a, very, in a terrific way. So it gives you a lot of gains, but you know, it has a price. It depends on you if you can use it or not. Or not. One of the things is, so what are we going to do? Are we going to convert all our backend developers that, have, that are now used to like, you know, PHP, Symfony 2, and so on, 
no magic. Uh, or are we going to hire front-end developers? Well, let me tell you that, you know, Angular is more of a back-end framework, you know? Like, you will do, like, very less of UI, you know? You haven't seen any jQuery code and so on, because that stuff belongs to the UI layer. Angular renders, you know? It does model, it does controller, it does also parts of the view. But that stuff that you would have done in jQuery earlier, you, you will still do it in jQuery if you want. Um, so it's very similar to a, to a back-end framework from, from that point of view. So what we did initially um, was to you know, convert part of our team to get them working on Angular. And they found it, like, at the beginning, a little bit scary. At the beginning, they found the whole idea of JavaScript a little bit scary. But then like, they adapted to it. So it's, it's really like, if you know the best practices, if you've been developing Symfony applications for a few years, if you know like, um, like when a class has too many dependencies, when a controller is doing too much, you'll be able to apply the same rules to Angular. So, and the syntax is the only thing that changes, okay, other than the platform. Though the learning curve could be like, you know, a bit harder than you think. It's not like, you know, um, it's not just like moving uh, like a guy from here to there and you'll be able to be productive immediately. You'll have to learn APIs, you'll have to learn like, you know, what a promise is if he wants to consume those APIs, what catching an error in a promise means, um, and stuff like that. So there are like a few things that are very different that, uh, that you know, we're not, we were not used to. Um, so you'll have to, to think of, of giving them like some time to, you know, clarify those kind of, uh, those kind of things. What we ended up with though is, um, part of our team that is just JavaScript developers. And then when we need, we get, you know, like some of the other guys that have been uh, doing stuff with Angular. Um, and it works pretty well. So we have like a core front end, a core JavaScript team, let's say, that works on both Node and Angular, you know, vanilla JavaScript. Um, and then they get help from some of the back end guys, the ones that know Angular uh, the most. And of course, the asynchronous trap. We write three instructions, and the first one will be executed, the second one will be executed, and the third one will be executed. A JavaScript, no. It has this little thing that, you know, like, you might write the code like in a sequential way, but then it does the how it wants with it. Um, so it's not something that everyone is used to. Um, so you need to, you know, fall like into another paradigm. Um, so you don't have to, you have to think out of the box when you're, you know, like writing JavaScript and not think like, hey, I'm writing these three things that will be executed sequentially. No, it depends. It's scary sometimes, but you get used to it after a bit. One of the very important things is, um, you know, get someone to dive into DevTools. Uh, there are a lot of blogs and a lot of, you know, um, guys that, uh, that, you know, blog regularly about DevTools because they have a lot of cool features. You can observe um, objects. Uh, you can, you know, like print tables with, uh, with whatever, with, um, with variables and so on. It's actually quite, they're actually quite powerful. Um, so you can, like, with just one line in the, in the, um, in the DevTools, you can highlight all divs and all the layers in your application. So it is a very powerful tool, and I would recommend you. Um, well, the first thing is Igor Vita uh, is one of, the, one, of the make, one of the members of the Make the Web Fast team at Google. Um, he's been blogging a lot about, you know, uh, high performance, and, and, uh, and he has a lot of content about, uh, about uh, uh, JavaScript as well. Um, then you get, like, you know, like those random blogs that, that pop in and out uh, every, every now and then. And then Eddie used my oldest money, which is, which I think it works at Google. Um, I mean, this guy's crazy. I think he, he does, like, one presentation every, every, every week. He has a lot of content. Um, I would recommend you to follow him on Twitter, on Speaker Deck, and so on, because he has like really good content on you know front-end development workflows, how to work with DevTools, and so on. Like he is the guy. Then I don't know how many of you have worked with Gulp or Grunt. Okay, how many with Gulp? Uh, okay, 50-50. I mean, almost no question. Let Grunt die. Not because I hate it or whatever, it's just the gulp feels much cleaner. And I'm telling you, like after building, I think around eight JavaScript projects over the past, you know, like year or so, you know, like going from grunt to gulp was like 
ending up in paradise after, you know, like being uh, stabbed in hell. Um, so, I mean, ground fires tend to be uh, fat, bloated, and, uh, and kind of uh, not nice. Uh, whereas Gob feels like much cleaner. So, if you wanna, if you wanna use the task runner for JavaScript, uh, you know, like I would, I would recommend you guys to to go for Gob. Testing, from you know our perspective, it, it's always gonna be hard. There are tools to do continuous integration. We did. Um, we use Sauceops. Thing is, sometimes you know, like they don't work as as they're supposed to be. You know, like you have like to boot a VM on Sauce Lab and then connect from Travis CI or from your machines. You can also, sorry, you can also use Enounce tools. You can use Jenkins locally and have you know a VM that you, that you spin up with Windows. It's just that you know it feels much heavier than just running tests with PHP unit and then replicating them on Travis CI. So testing is something that will take some time as it's not very immediate. And I was mentioning Angular too. So, I mean, things are quite like under, under development, under discussion at the moment. So, of all the things that I've said, you can trash everything about controllers, directives, scope, uh, modules, and jQuery Lite, which is like the, the version of jQuery that they use. Um, so, what happens is that they're rewriting a lot of stuff. And, for example, the, the way you're de going to declare directives is going to change drastically. Uh, there won't be controllers anymore. You're only going to use uh, directives and a lot of other minor changes. You know, they're also going to be introducing AdScript, you know, uh, an alternative um, scripting language for some parts of, of, of Angular. So you'll be able to use this, this AdScript. I would recommend you to go over the, um, over the spec to see what changes. It's basically, you know, a, a superset of, uh, of, of JavaScript. And then, like, if you want to follow up on what they're doing, just look at uh, their design documents, because they're public. So, for people like me, you know, it's pretty scary, because I know that stuff, you know, is going to change, like, quite fast. Um, you have, you know, like, one very, very good strategy to, to keep up with the, with the changes that they're going to make is that do not build monoliths, you know? Do not build large applications. Build small services that you'll be able to upgrade in one week, maybe and not in like three months, because you have to upgrade from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Um, so from my personal perspective, when people ask me like, what do you think about Angular, is the future? I'm like, maybe. I mean, it's a very good tool. Um, at the same time, our job is safe, you know? But we still need backend developers, and we're very happy. We'll still be, we use WordPress, and we're less happy. And, you know, at the same time, it provides you with one of the building blocks of a natural evolution. So the coupled apps, an API, like something that consumes an API, it's a very good solution for a lot of scenarios, or I would say some of them, and it is a future. Another thing that you should look at, for example, if you're into front-end development is React, this library, this UI library built by Facebook uh, that introduced, I think, the concept of virtual DOM, so, uh, it uses you know, an algorithm to, uh, to optimize the way it, uh, it changes the DOM and works with the DOM. But it's not like, like a full stack framework like Angular. It's just one of the libraries uh, that you can use. Um, at the same time, one of the newest approaches in front end is you know, like to write these isomorphic apps where you have the same code that runs on the client and on the server. So what happens with single page applications usually is that you go live and you're like, shit, Google can't see it, you know, because it's all JavaScript. So the way um, isomorphic apps work is that they solve this problem um, by you know, rendering on the server. And as soon as they render on the server, you know, there will be some JavaScript on the client that will take the stage and transform the application in a single page job, reusing what you, the, the same code that you had on the server. It feels like a little bit sketchy, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting way to share code on the client and the server and have the, both of, the, the best of both worlds. So my personal feedback after, you know, like a while working with Angular is, you know, it was a very great introduction into scaling to the clients. Um, at the same time, I think two weeks should be enough for your guys to, you know, get accustomed to it. Um, it's not going to be like very hard. You won't need like three months to, to, you know, write decent code or understand how it works. On a larger scale, and I always debate the fact that we need a larger scale, 
Um, but on a larger scale, you might want to look into something that is less full stack and just use, you know, like, um, like a, a smaller, uh, a less bloated framework. But I, would, I still go for Angular for a lot of the things because we don't build large scale projects. We have microservices, so for us it's, it's very easy to tackle complexity and so on. Um, without paying too much attention, the performances are very, very decent. Um, so even like we use it for our mobile website and one, thinks, one can think that you know like mobile devices might be sluggish and so on. We didn't do a lot of optimization and the website looks quite sleek. You can go to namshi.com and see how it, it works. If you browse the website, it's just an Angular app. Um, it's very easy. If you have been used to work with your hierarchical MVC, uh, it's something that you know, like we had in Symfony 1 as well, we have in Symfony 2, and um, it was there in Rails and so on, so it's very easy um, if, you, if you already know the concepts to work with Angular. And the tooling around it is extremely, extremely powerful. So if you want to do something, go check GitHub or Google uh, if there is already a library to do that, because usually there is. At the same time, the recommendation is to write very, very small apps. Don't get tangled in a single code base. Use microservices and don't get stuck in monoliths. Do not build monoliths. The main idea is decouple, decouple, and decouple everything. And once you've decoupled, just decouple some more. Okay? It's very important that you, know, like you fight complexity because um, that's what's going to kill uh, your projects. I guess we're a bit tired. And I guess the coffee break uh, will help you. Uh, so I said, you know, at the beginning I will introduce myself at the end. I'm Alex. Um, you can insult me at underscore Dean underscore on Twitter, especially after this presentation. Um, I work for Namshi. As I said, it's an e-commerce e retailer in the Middle East. We're based in Dubai. Um, I am VP technology there. You can find me ranting or, uh, you know, writing very boring stuff at odino.org. Um, yeah, that is it. Thank you very much. There is one more thing before questions. We're hiring, okay? We're looking for top-notch people. Um, we have good packages, but we, what's better is our architecture. We use a service render architecture. We use Symfony 2, Angular, Node, Redis, um, Solar still. We're trying to move to Elasticsearch. I mean, we have like, a lot of good tools. We're using Docker. Um, so it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. We offer good packages, three, four, five thousand euros as net salary, uh, depending you know, on, your, uh, on your level. So if you want to just ping me, because uh, we, we need some, you know, we need to beef up the team, I will be very, uh, very happy to get someone from the community itself. If you have any questions, keep them for yourself.